I found it was easier to buy heroin in prison than it was to obtain paracetamol. My name's Chris Atkins. I'm a filmmaker who went to prison in 2016 for a white collar crime. I've since written two books about it. The first one is just a diary of my time in Wandsworth. And the second one is called Time After Time, which is about why so many prisoners reoffend after they get out. In British jails, prisoners are locked in their cells for sometimes up to 24 hours a day. So naturally, you're going to want to find things to keep you amused and entertained. If you know the right people, you can pretty much get anything you want in prison. So I think a lot of the cases, it's down to bribery, it's down to corruption, and flat screen TVs are going to find their ways into certain cells. Almost certainly, an officer or a member of staff has been paid off and it's made its way magically from the education department into somebody's cell. Once these things get into the system, they then sort of get passed around. When someone's coming up for release, you'll find a lot of other prisoners being really, really nice to them because they want to inherit their stuff. Some prisoners are allowed PlayStation. There's this bonkers system inside called Incentives and Earned Privileges, or IEP. Every prisoner gets an IEP status. And if you brown nose your way up to enhanced level, which I did after a few months, then you're kind of like the top tier. It's like being head boy at school. So when you have IEP enhanced, it means there's certain things that you're allowed to have, and one of them is a PlayStation. But as you can imagine, like everything else in the prison system, it's stupidly bureaucratic and it's completely full of holes and it's wide open to abuse. So if you've got a bit of money and you've got the right connections, you can get yourself a PlayStation even if you're not enhanced. And then if you've got a few more friends and a few more connections, you can get yourself an Xbox, which you're not supposed to have. I knew people who had 4G dongles that were going into the back of their computers or the back of their TVs, so they were streaming movies every night. There's a lot of restrictions that are put in place to stop people doing this, but like I said, these prisons are so short-staffed and officers are just completely run ragged that it's pretty easy for people to get access to these things. Cash is actually useless within prison because what the hell are you going to spend it on? And also, you're not allowed to have cash in prison, so it's good old-fashioned bartering. The basic, sort of most ubiquitous form of prison currency, I'd say, is tin tuna, which I found deeply ironic because I don't like tuna, but I had stacks and stacks and stacks of it in my cell. I never ate any of it because I think it's quite disgusting, but as a form of payment, so if you want your clothes cleaned, if you want to borrow someone's stereo, if you want a haircut or something like that, then you'd just pay a few tins of tuna. The exchange rate was fluid, put it this way, and often it was sort of, you know, whatever you're gonna pay, whatever you can get away with. So I think my laundry was two tins of tuna, but if you wanted the guy to put some conditioner in and fold them, then maybe slip in a third. I quit smoking the day I went to prison, but I always had a few packs of amber leaf lying around the place in case I needed to pay someone off for something. So there was a guy in my wing who had actually gone in for murder, but he was also quite a well-trained sports masseuse and physiotherapist. So when I put my back out, I went to speak to the prison healthcare. They just sort of laughed in my face and gave me some paracetamol. But I found out there was this guy who was very good with people's backs. So I gave him a pack of tobacco and he sorted out the knots in my back. Prison kettles are great because they have a flat base. There's no filament in them. It means you can use them to fry your onions and, and your peppers and your garlic. And then we'd put in our meat and brown the meat and then we'd add our tomatoes and our herbs. And then we'd boil the kettle. We could then make pasta and rice uh, and give ourselves a slap up meal. So once I've been there six months, I never ate in the prison servery. I was just ordering ingredients off the canteen, make friends with people in the kitchen, slip them some tuna and some tobacco fill in a form for them and then start dropping stuff by your cell on the way back. British prisons are absolutely riddled with drugs from top to bottom. It's much easier to get hold of drugs in prison than it is on the outside. And you really have to go and want to actually experience the madness of it firsthand. In, in a lot of cases, the prisons themselves supply the drugs. A lot of people go into prison with heroin addictions and they're prescribed drugs to combat those heroin addictions. And those drugs themselves are then used by other prisoners to get high. So Subutex is a big one. Lots of people are given Subutex and they don't take it, they sell it to other people who crush it up and snort it. You have drugs like uh, pregabalin, which is a painkiller. A lot of prisoners are prescribed this and of course these painkillers are abused. Obviously spice is a major problem in prisons. It's very popular because it doesn't show up on piss tests and it's exceptionally potent and you can take it in small doses and just get knocked out for the entire day. Spice obviously fuels violence. It also fuels huge medical problems, like people collapse on spice all the time. It's called spice attacks. And uh, a lot of it involves corrupting officers and members of staff. I think an ounce of spice costs about 150 to 200 pounds on the outside. 
On a prison wing, it's worth about two, two and a half thousand pounds. A lot of prison officers or civilian staff who work in jails are paid barely above minimum wage. So if you go to people like that and offer them thousands of pounds a week to take in a few handfuls of drugs, it's very difficult for them to say no. I mean, if you think about it, you're getting thousands and thousands of heavy duty drug addicts and you're putting them in a place where they're forced to live with thousands and thousands of drug dealers. So you have supply and demand crushed together. You put them in cells together. You don't let them out. You don't let them do anything except sit around going out of their minds. And guess what? They're going to want to hit. I think prison hooch is a little bit of a myth. It does exist but it's a huge amount of work to make it happen. So, and it's absolutely revolting, uh, where it's much easier just to pay a corrupt guard to bring in some crack or heroin or spice. The dealers like the addicts getting into debt. So I knew several dealers who were on my wing who kept giving the addicts on my wing drugs that they knew that addict was never, ever, ever gonna be able to afford. And they would keep them on the hook because it meant when that dealer needed something doing, he could just tell the addict to do it because the addict owes him a thousand pounds and with interest going up every week. So what they'll say to him is, oh, your girlfriend's coming to visit next week. Brilliant. Someone's going to meet her on the outside. They're going to give her a couple of ounces of spice. She's going to stick it in her knickers and she's going to pass it to you in the visits hall. If it goes ahead, great. I'm going to get that two ounces of spice. Thank you very much. That's now come to me. That's worth two and a half thousand pounds. I can sell that round the wing. If you get caught, you get caught. You're the one who's going to do time. If I want someone beaten up, I'm going to go to you and say, you've got to go and beat that person up. Thank you very much. And if I get caught with a mobile phone, you're going to go to the governor and say, actually, that's my phone. I put it in this cell. So they string people along for a reason. In a lot of cases, they'll say, you haven't got any money, but I know you've got some access to funds on the outside. So you get a mobile phone, you call them up, you say, here's a sort code, here's the account number. And your mum, your girlfriend, your dad, your aunt, I don't give a f is going to make a payment to my girlfriend's account of 200 pounds or you're gonna get slashed up. So these transfers are all happening on the outside between friends and family accounts.